Welcome to Functional Philosophy, the show in which I, Charles II, explain and apply Ayn Rand's philosophy, Objectivism. If you'd like to ask me a question on Objectivism or its application, just go to charles2.com slash contact. And my last name is spelled T as in tango, E as in echo, and W as in whiskey. Hello everyone, let's see what questions I have today. This first one I think is from Rucka from a while back. I mentioned something about communism being platonic and environmentalism being Kantian and he wanted me to elaborate. Well, this is not an original point of mine, Peikoff makes this point, but communism is platonic because it is essentially supernatural and mystical. It is based on this allegedly materialistic, but really supernatural process of development of society from feudalism to capitalism to socialism, communism. It is also collectivist, and Plato saw society as a kind of super organism with individuals as the cells of this greater organism. That is obviously an aspect of communism. There's this heavenly aspect of a greater future to come when communism has finally been implemented. We don't have to have Stalinist, so-called Stalinist, purges anymore. It's just like heaven. I mean, you have to understand, a rational conception of communism treats it like a religion. That's all it is. I mean, it doesn't have a personal god which in the Western conception of religion is uh, a distinguishing feature, but that's not really important. I mean, it's more sophisticated to have uh, an impersonal force, as communism and Eastern religion does, but religion is a primitive form of supernatural. I mean, supernaturalism itself is primitive, but you can have more philosophical versions of it. And that's what Plato is, and that's what communism is. You know, this reminds me of something that annoys me about religious conservatives. How they talk about, oh, the left treats their ideas like a religion. Social justice is a religion. These leftists, they have heretics just like religions. They have dogma just like religions. They're so religious. But then they drop that like a hot potato <laughs> when it comes to communism. When it comes to implementing these ideas politically, oh, now it's the atheistic communists. Oh, well, you know, atheist mass murderers like Stalin, they're atheists. What happened to this? The left treats their ideas like a religion. I thought they were religious about their ideas. But as soon as it's actually implemented, it starts killing a bunch of people and being disastrous. Oh, that's atheism. That's on atheism. Sorry. I mean, that's, that's just what you get with atheism. That's what you get with a godless society. I thought the left treated their ideas like a religion. Anyway, so that's, that's, that's why communism comes from Plato. Now, environmentalism is Kantian because it doesn't advocate any better future. It is total nihilism. It's not you're going to have a better future down the road. You're not sacrificing for some supernatural entity or a better future. There is no beneficiary, and that's uniquely Kantian. Sacrifice for nothing. Not, you know, the communists wanted to industrialize. They wanted the benefits of capitalism. Environmentalists don't want that. They want to destroy industrialization. They want to destroy man in favor of as close to nothing as, as is possible. Just inanimate matter. That is Kant. So communism is just religion, which is Plato. Environmentalism is outright nihilism, and that's Kant. All right. Next, this questioner says, I have a question about free will and morality. Again, he capitalizes free will and morality. Why do people capitalize random words? That's not a rule in English. You don't just capitalize words you think are important. I have a question about free will and morality. I am pretty new to objectivism. I read The Fountainhead, The Virtue of Selfishness, and I'm starting Atlas Shrugged. All right, I'm going to do some on-the-fly editing to make this... Uh, question grammatical. I am sure objectivists do not believe human beings have an internal soul. So without a soul, then how do human beings make the conscious choices that they make? Well, why are you sure objectivists don't believe in an internal soul? I don't know what internal here is supposed to mean as opposed to an external soul. I don't understand this. 
Um, maybe meant eternal? Uh, well, we don't believe in an eternal soul. We don't believe in a soul that survives the body. But there definitely is a soul with the body, as long as it exists. I mean, in a, in a living form. So human beings do make choices because they have a soul or consciousness. There's nothing mystical about a soul. Consciousness, reason, free will, volition. These are not mystical things. Those things are just natural properties of certain kinds of organisms. Then he asks, Wouldn't the law of identity disprove the idea of free will since the universe works mechanically? This includes our neurons. Well, the law of identity does not mean a mechanical universe in the sense that every part of the universe is mechanical in the sense of linear. All identity says is things are what they are and aren't what they aren't. That does not rule out things that can go in different directions. It just means they can only go in one of a defined, limited set of directions. It means you have a defined, limited set of choices, but they're still choices. It's not determined. You can have choices. You can have a non-linear entity or faculty as long as it is limited and has an identity. So the choice is not one or infinity. You can have options that aren't innumerable and therefore lacking an identity. So choice is not a violation of the law of identity. And then he goes on with his last question, since there is no God, then how do we know if the objective morality of objectivism is objective? Well, by looking at the world and using reason. I don't know how to answer this since it's such a beginner question. I, I, it's not that I don't know how to answer it, but I could not conceivably convince you of this if you're asking such basic questions. That's not an insult. Everybody has to ask basic questions first, but... Uh, I can't say it in any way that isn't overly broad like that. I mean, if you're asking this, you don't even know what morality is, so I'd have to go into that. But I'll just point out here that God doesn't make morality objective. Religious people love to do this. They play this switch with objectivity. They're not objective. They are intrinsic. <laughs> you know, Dennis Prager and, I mean, religious people in general talk about this, but Dennis Prager talks about it, or he has admitted it. But yes, things are good because God said they're good. That's objective. That's not objective. That's intrinsic. That's things are good apart from any consequences, apart from any relationship you have to those allegedly good things. There's no objectivity there. That's, that's in fact, total subjectivism. It's just God's subjective whim, not yours. So, again, you see this slippery connection between intrinsicism and subjectivism. The existence of God doesn't make anything objective. Saying it's objective because of God is precisely, literally, the same thing as saying something is objective because. Something is good because. Because what? There is no what. Just because. Well, if you know what's stupid about that, then you know what's stupid about saying that God would make morality objective. Next, what do you think of evolutionary psychology, i.e. the evolution does not stop at the neck argument? Well, I plan to do this question here on the podcast, but I've talked about that a lot recently. Well, that is a total straw man, of course. The idea that people have the faculty of reason and are born tabula rasa does not mean that the mind is formless, structureless, has no evolved identity. It does, but evolution does not mean biological determinism. This is what they're trying to say here. Oh, well, if you believe in evolution, then you must be a biological determinist. No. In fact, it is totally anti-evolutionary to deny reason because that has been the result of our evolution by natural selection. It has resulted in us having reason. So all these people going around denying that crucial faculty and saying, well, we just use reason to rationalize, and we're really just driven by these innate urges, and all of the content is built into our minds. These are the anti-scientific, anti-evolutionary thinkers, so-called, because they are denying the most salient, evolved characteristic of human beings. And they want to go around claiming the mantle 
of Darwin and evolution, please. And I think I'll do one more here. All right, next. Does all meaningful abstract thought have its origin and completion in Ayn Rand's philosophy? That is to ask, if you accept objectivism as truth, is there nothing else to learn? It's kind of ironic because as humans, we have an innate and pure drive towards attaining truth, but once we reach it, we fear the nothingness that is beyond. He ended that with a question mark for some reason. If anything, I guess I'm just asking for a different way of viewing it, one that is less nihilistic because I don't enjoy being nihilistic. Thanks. Nobody does, really. Well, first of all, no. All meaningful abstract thought does not have its origin and completion in Ayn Rand's philosophy. I mean, first, the origin, that's to imply that <laughs> there's never any meaningful abstract thought before Ayn Rand? I mean, that's ludicrous. And completion, no. Ayn Rand is not Muhammad. She is not the final prophet of philosophy. There's no ban on innovation here. In terms of what objectivism is, it is a system of ideas, philosophical ideas, those held by Ayn Rand. Now, she did not discover every truth, not even every known truth. Obviously, other people discovered philosophical truths before her. She discovered many more, but not everything. So there is a false dichotomy here. It is not either, I agree with Ayn Rand completely, and therefore there's nothing else to discover, or there's more to discover, and therefore I reject some of what Ayn Rand said. No, you can believe she's right as far as she went. And that's my position. I am an objectivist. I believe Ayn Rand's philosophy is completely true, but it is not all of philosophy. I mean, she knew that, obviously. She knew there was a hell of a lot she had not worked out. So being an objectivist just means that you agree that Ayn Rand's philosophy is true as far as it goes. It doesn't mean you can't believe things in addition to that, philosophical things. It just means you can't contradict Ayn Rand's philosophy. I mean, you can and be moral, but you're just not an objectivist, which is fine if that's just an honest mistake. So that's in terms of what objectivism is. But to get to your real concern, which is, is there anything else to figure out? I mean, obviously, outside of philosophy, I can't imagine that, I mean, you can't really believe that there's nothing left to figure out in physics. You don't need physics if you have objectivism, or you don't need uh, literature, or engineering, or whatever. There's a lot to figure out about reality, and there's still a lot to figure out in philosophy. I am figuring some of them out. Believe me, if you want to be a philosopher, there are still jobs here. If you master these ideas and you start finding yourself bumping up against the frontier, you start finding yourself asking questions to which no one has answers that you can find, when you get to that point, you will realize there are a lot of questions people don't have answers to. No one does. They haven't been answered. So, as someone who considers himself a philosopher, I can assure you there is no shortage of work to be done. If you'd like to keep up with everything I do, just go to charles2.com. If you'd like to enable me to do more, just go to patreon.com slash charles2 and become a supporter. Thanks for listening.